The Cold War may seem far away, but it dominated America's thinking for much of the second half of the 20th century. Today, we want to understand one person in the U.S. who sought to grapple with its centrality while focusing on improving America's standing in the Middle East. How do you both preserve close ties with the Soviets, but at the same time marginalize them in the Middle East, even if it meant going on the highest form of nuclear alert since the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis? How do you move a leading supporter in the Middle East to be close to Washington and not to Moscow? How do you preserve historic ties with Israel during a war, knowing that they are worried that you are trying to achieve other foreign policy goals at your expense. How do you juggle all of this at the same time? Today, we will discuss the 1973 war in the Mideast and the role played by Henry Kissinger. Hello, and welcome to Decision Points, a podcast looking at the U.S. role in the Mideast and the U.S.-Israel relationship. I'm David Makovsky, the Ziegler Distinguished Fellow of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And I'm excited to go on this journey through history with you. Henry Kissinger was born in humble circumstances in Weimar, Germany, yet rose to become one of America's top foreign policy thinkers. He was and still is the only person ever to simultaneously hold the positions of National Security Advisor and Secretary of State. He engineered detente or a relaxation of tensions with the Soviet Union He engineered the normalization of ties with China and was critical in ensuring disengagement agreements between Israel, Egypt, and Syria in the aftermath of the 1973 war. Kissinger was the face of American foreign policy during much of the Nixon years. He was a grand strategic thinker who wrote sprawling theses on concepts of world power and the European balance of power. As American politics became increasingly polarized during the Nixon administration, so too did public opinion about Kissinger and his foreign policy, which was rooted in realpolitik and incrementalism. Kissinger is better known for his policies, both triumphs and failures, in Southeast Asia, in Vietnam, and Latin America, then in the Middle East. This is not without cause, because Nixon didn't want Jews handling the Israel file, Kissinger was deliberately kept out of the Middle East policy, at least until 1970, when Israel mobilized at the U.S. request to defend Jordan from a Syrian invasion. Kissinger became Secretary of State in September 1973, just one month before the outbreak of the 1973 war, when Egypt and Syria launched a devastating surprise attack on Israel during the holiest day of the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur. While the war ended with Israel recovering and being outside of Cairo and Damascus, it still exhausted the Arab military option, and the surprise attack left Israel shaken. In the midst of the war, Kissinger sensed an opportunity to reshape the Middle East order in America's favor. Kissinger approached the Middle East and the U.S.-Israel relationship like a multi-level chess game. At one level, there was the bilateral U.S.-Israel relationship, which had begun to grow since the Kennedy administration. It was characterized by economic and defense aid and intelligence cooperation, and utilized Israeli capabilities to support Arab monarchies like Saudi Arabia and Jordan, while opposing pro-Soviet Arab states like Egypt and Syria. At a higher level, there was the grand strategy game of the Cold War, taking precedence over any regional dynamic. U.S. policy on matters like the Arab-Israel conflict was subject to Cold War considerations, not just bilateral or regional issues. These multi-level considerations came into play in the 1973 war, when amid hopes for a ceasefire that would freeze the battlefield after the Egyptians had crossed the psychologically important Suez Canal, Kissinger delayed a crucial airlift of weapons and equipment to Israel for several days after the war began. One can debate whether it is the arrival of the airlift that led Israel to start to turn the tide of the war. Kissinger didn't want Israel to lose, which would empower the Soviets, but he didn't want Egypt to lose either. A relatively balanced outcome was core to Kissinger's plan to create a new order in the Mideast. 
Israel would continue to hold the lands it had conquered in the 1967 war, but with full awareness that this came at a high cost, while the Arab states would accept that they could not beat Israel with force. This would lead to Kissinger's preferred conclusion, both sides recognizing that they needed America's help to achieve their goals. This would bring Egypt over to America's side, reversing the failure of prior administrations to keep Nasser from allying with the Soviets. Between the end of the war and 1975, Kissinger made many, many flights between Cairo, Jerusalem, and Damascus to conclude incremental agreements on armistice boundaries, separation of forces, and the installation of UN peacekeeping forces on the Golan Heights and the Sinai Peninsula. This was called shuttle diplomacy. Kissinger did not believe the conditions were right for a comprehensive peace or that peace was a real possibility. In its place, he sought hard-headed practical solutions. In the Sinai, the disengagement agreements led to Sadat's dramatic political earthquake. The 1977 electrifying flight to Israel, culminating with the 1979 peace treaty between Israel and Egypt that is held to this day. On the Golan Heights, the disengagement has been a factor that has kept the peace for nearly 50 years. Today, with the peace process stalled, there is talk of, quote, managing or shrinking the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But without the sort of intensive, high-level diplomacy, Kissinger masterfully conducted. In light of the repeated failure of the all-or-nothing approach to peace, it is worth revisiting Kissinger's ideas about realism, incrementalism, order, and stability today. To discuss Henry Kissinger's approach to Arab-Israeli diplomacy and the U.S.-Israel relationship in the context of the Cold War and American grand strategy, we are joined today by Martin Indyk, who recently published a fascinating book, Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy. Martin is the former Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs, the top position at the State Department dealing with the Mideast and North Africa. He's a two-time ambassador to Israel and special envoy to the peace process in 2013 and 14. I should say I was a member of Martin's peace team in the 2013 and 14 time that worked out of the office of the Secretary of State. Martin is also a former vice president of the Brookings Institution and currently a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Martin was given extensive access to Kissinger's private papers while writing The Master of the Game, and he presents a never-before-seen material alongside a comprehensive analysis of Kissinger's Middle East foreign policy. Martin, thank you very much for joining us today. I really urge people to read this book. It's really first rate in terms of diplomatic history. You bring a whole set of facts that are not always known to people, your access to the Kissinger papers and the like. People who are interested in the Middle East and the Arab-Israel conflict and Arab-Israel relations today, this is a must read. So I'm really delighted that you joined us today. So let's go a little bit pre-73, if, if we can. Kissinger thought about regional order in the Middle East, but his academic life was based on understanding regional order in Europe. To what extent was Europe a guidepost to his thinking, or did he think the Middle East was very different, a set of circumstances and outlooks, and therefore Europe would have only limited value, and therefore the analysis had to be different? And to what extent did the 1970 crisis where Syrian tanks evade Jordan and the U.S. asks Israel to intervene and then the Syrians pull back, it's been described that this was a big moment in terms of looking at Israel as a, as a strategic asset for the United States. How important was this for Kissinger's thinking at the time? Before the 1973 Yom Kippur War, Kissinger viewed the Middle East through two lenses. One was a bureaucratic lens. Nixon had prevented him from having any role in the Middle East because he viewed him as pro-Israel because of his Jewishness. And he'd given the file to the State Department, to the Secretary of State. And so Kissinger was determined to undermine Rogers and try to get control of the file. The second lens was the Cold War lens of competition with the Soviet Union. 
At that point, the Soviet Union had established a strong position of influence in the region through close relationships with the radical Arab states, Egypt, Syria, and Iraq. And Kissinger had the Israelis, the Saudis, the Iranians, and to some extent the Turks uh, to work with. So from his point of view, he was quite determined, and he said this publicly early on in the first term of the Nixon administration, that their objective was to evict the Soviet Union from the Middle East, and that sooner or later the Arabs would turn on the Soviet Union and then the United States would need to respond. In the meantime, in typical Kissinger realist fashion, he sought to establish a balance of power in the region based on Iran and Israel having a preponderance of power over their Arab competitors or or adversaries. And that equilibrium in the balance of power tilted in favour of the pro-American status quo powers in the region was the way that he thought he could stabilise the situation. But he made sure to bolster that through detente with the Soviet Union and an explicit understanding with the Soviet Union that neither side would seek to take advantage of the other, unilateral advantage of the other in the region. So it was a local balance of power bolstered by detente. And that's what he thought would hold. What he didn't understand was that Egypt in particular, in the form of Anwar Sadat, could not abide this status quo and was determined to disrupt it. So he did precisely what Kissinger had publicly called on the Arab states to do. He evicted Soviet military advisors from Egypt in July of 1972 and wanted to engage with Kissinger, wanted to send his national security advisor to the United States to talk to him about concerting strategy. And Kissinger said, well, why should I do anything for Sadat? He kicked out the Soviets without coming to me, so why should I pay him anything? He regarded him as a buffoon. That was his word that he used, as a character from the opera Aida, which is set in Egypt. So he didn't take him seriously, and he thought that the construct that I'm describing could hold. Now, you asked about the 1970 crisis in Jordan, and that just reinforced his sense that the balance of power was tilted in favour of status quo and and could hold. Because there, as you said, the Syrians took advantage of a an uprising by the PLO against the Hashemite kingdom, and the Syrians sent in their tanks, backed by the Soviet Union, and Kissinger got Israel to mobilise on the Golan Heights. And with that, the Jordanians encouraged Kissinger to do that. And with that, King had enough ability to go against the Syrians and basically push them out. And it was that strategic coordination between the United States and Israel in support of Jordan that was, for Kissinger, proof of the concept that he then sought to develop, which was, as you said, Israel could serve a strategic purpose for the United States by working with the United States to back the status quo, including backing those Arab monarchies that were threatened by the Soviet-backed Arab, Arab radicals. So 1970 was a breakthrough for his approach to the region, and it was a breakthrough in terms of his bureaucratic battle because he showed Nixon that his approach was more effective than the approach that Rogers was pushing of trying to negotiate a ceasefire and negotiate with the Soviet Union over what would happen in the region. Europe, he understands, is very different in that, you know, he's dealing with the whole different set of actors. He sees the enmity of the Arabs as, at this point, pretty much as, as, as a constant. And as you point out in the book, that seems to have a huge impact on his thinking. But now let's bring it to 73, where he seems here, too, to be working at different levels simultaneously. On one hand, 
I think what you said about that he saw detente as something that would restrain the Soviets and by extension the United States too, that no one would see to exploit restraint. And in that regard, that might have been a reason for him to think, okay, look at the battlefield. Yes, the, the Egyptians have crossed the Suez Canal, but Israel's very existence is an imperiled. Therefore, I keep detente by maintaining restraint. And if there's post-war diplomacy, so it might start at a different place. Now, this doesn't endear Kissinger to Israel because of the delay in the airlift and that Israel agreed to a ceasefire in place, meaning freeze the battlefield with Egypt ahead, something that Israel couldn't have imagined agreeing to before the war, but now with its planes shot down by the Soviet air defenses over the canal, they agree. Now, it just seems that Kissinger's world is kind of rocked when, and as your point correctly points out, that he wants to marginalize the Soviets before the war. But now he sees the Soviets are out to exploit this sense of restraint, of American restraint that he thought undergirded detente and by sending an airlift, and that therefore the Soviets would get the credit for the outcome of the war. Kissinger seems furious and reinforces his view they should be marginalized, and he wants to throw everything into the battle and into the airlift, pledges to go forward by helping Israel, it it seems, stem the tide of the war. And indeed, it, it, it succeeds, it seems. But the, the question is to me, is their attention in the relationship, wanting to get the Egyptians to be seen as having crossed the canal and hopefully bring them into the orbit, although maybe in the middle of the war, the fog of battle, he doesn't know what's possible because he hasn't yet engaged to that. That's a post-war thing. But the fact is, there seems to be somewhat of a tension between him wanting to be sure that Egypt is not humiliated, not the loser, And yet at the end, to be sure that the Soviets are the loser and threading that needle might not seem that easy, given that Egypt was using Soviet weapons. So this is where his experience and knowledge of Europe came to be highly relevant from his point of view. Beforehand, it was just a straight balance of power game. But once Sadat rocked the status quo, Kissinger came to understand that he would have to create a new order in the Middle East. So that essentially blew up the old order. And when it came to creating a new order, he borrowed from his knowledge of 19th century Europe when the conservative powers led by Austria and Great Britain restored order in Europe after the trauma of and huge losses of the Napoleonic Wars. And so that was his model, as elaborated in his first book, which was his PhD dissertation on called The World Restored. So he was trying to create an order in the region based on that. In doing so, he felt it essential, as you suggested, that while on the one hand Israel could not be defeated by Soviet arms, on the other hand, Egypt could not be defeated if he were to bring Egypt into the new order that he was trying to create. So he had to walk a very fine line, neither defeat for either one, if he could hand manage it. But in the process of trying to negotiate the ceasefire, he discovered that Sadat was not at all interested in a ceasefire. And you're right that the Israelis accepted a ceasefire, but as I explained in the book, the reason that they did so was not so much because they were in desperate straits, although they were, their situation was difficult, but it was because they had intelligence that the Egyptians were about to launch into a new offensive to try to cross Sinai and take the passes. And when they got that intelligence, they said, well, we'll tell Kissinger we accept the ceasefire because we know, which Kissinger did not know, that the Egyptians are not going to accept it. They're going to launch an offensive. So we can gain 
the brownie points of saying we were ready for a ceasefire. It won't cost us anything because the Egyptians are the ones who will, who will refuse it. So that that was the game that was going on. Kissinger didn't know that. You know, in, in those days, the United States had very little battlefield intelligence, real-time battlefield intelligence in that war. The Soviets did because they had their Fox Bat intelligence aircraft flying over the battlefield out of Cairo West Airport. But, but the Americans were dependent on the Israelis and the Israelis weren't telling them. So that was the game he was trying to play. He wanted to limit the damage to detente to the extent possible. He wanted to come out of it in a way that he could work with both Egypt and Israel, that Israel would be humble but not defeated, that Egypt's pride would remain intact, but that they, if they wanted to achieve their objectives of regaining territory, they would have to do it through American auspices of a negotiation rather than relying on Soviet weapons. To the extent they relied on Soviet weapons, he wanted to make it clear to them they were going to lose. But he was willing to play hardball, Kissinger, here in a way that this is the, like arms things have been held up before. You detail in the disengagement agreement at certain points, he held up things on the military side. Again, he didn't think he was imperiling Israel's existence. You could see how the whole idea of holding up arms in a war could, you know, it was a controversial move. Well, yeah, I think it's it's often misunderstood, but your basic point is correct. He understood that American arms supplies to Israel, especially in a crisis, gave the United States immense leverage. But as he argued to his staff at the time and to Haig, who was chief of staff to Nixon, and to Nixon also, he argued to them, look, we have to be on Israel's side in this crisis so that we can turn against them, quote unquote, when it comes to the ceasefire. That was his calculation. He, as I said before, he did not want Israel to lose. And when it looked like they were losing in the early days of the war, that's when he decided that the United States needed to launch a resupply effort. But he wanted to do it in a way that would be low profile because he was concerned that the Arabs would respond by imposing an oil embargo, which is precisely what they did once they saw the resupply. So he tried to keep it at a low level, as you point out. The Russians started coming in and resupplying, and the Israelis told him that they were having trouble because of the lack of supply. And it was at that point that he went to Nixon, and there was Nixon who said, look, stop screwing around, send everything. And Nixon ordered that, and that's when they stepped in and basically provided everything. But Kissinger always had in mind that when the time came for a ceasefire, he would turn on Israel and force them to accept a ceasefire. What mattered was to get Israeli military pressure on Egypt to get Sadat to accept a ceasefire, and then he would turn around and get Israel to do it. I actually had a chance to talk to Kissinger about, because Quant in his book, Decade of Decision, and Quant served at the National Security Council, and he said this was one of the biggest decisions in government he remembered. I asked Kissinger about it, but in Kissingerian fashion, he kind of poo-pooed it. He goes, oh, yeah, but he was at the NSC, but that's like, he was in the underbrush, I think was the word, but that doesn't surprise you. But so look, sometimes the best laid plans get intersected with reality. And Sadat turns out to be not the Aida figure that Kissinger thought, but a real strategic thinker who was willing to flip sides. And I'm just trying to think of that juncture with reality. I think you write that the war was created a, a plastic moment that he could use to mold the new reality. But he had the good fortune of having Anwar Sadat, who turns out to be like, you know, this historic figure of the 20th century, to have him as a partner. And I'm just trying to think about how Kissinger's plans for in the post-war as it began. And when Nixon said, Henry, you know, you got to go do this. And with the oil embargo, you got to bring diplomacy. And maybe he wanted to do it anyway, as you suggest. But to what extent did Kissinger thought would happen? And the fact that the Sadat factor, it seems like it's rocket fuel for Kissinger. And it, it had to lead to a rethink. 
Absolutely. But the rethinking started during the war when he came to understand very early in the war that Sadat's war aims were limited from a communication he got from the Egyptian National Security Advisor and that, in fact, what his real purpose was was to start a peace negotiation. And so Kissinger immediately came to understand that he had underestimated Sadat. First of all, in not expecting him to dare to launch war. And then, in terms of his war aims, being tied to diplomacy, something that Kissinger could relate to. So that was the first thing. But then, when he sat down and engaged with Sadat and tried to explain to him why it was in Egypt's interests to go for a limited ceasefire and and disengagement agreement, He found Sadat willing to accept whatever he basically put on the table without argument. And he was nonplussed by this at first and then realised that here he had a partner who was prepared to basically put himself in Kissinger's hands and go with him. From Sadat's point of view, it was the United States that would have to deliver Israel and he wasn't going to worry about the details. That was just the basic principle. And Kissinger was immediately impressed by this. As you say, it gave him the means to go back to the Israelis and get them to respond. And he readily admits to this day that he could not have achieved any of the agreements that he achieved in the Middle East without Sadat. That Sadat was critical to this. So critical that in a book that he's just published on leadership in which he profiles the great Western leaders that he's dealt with, he nevertheless included a chapter on Sadat. And the chapter is about the visionary nature of Sadat's leadership. So, look, Kissinger's gradualism seemed to emerge from certain assumptions. Among them, and, and you really detail this a lot in the book, that the Arabs were not conceptually ready to come to grips with the legitimacy of, his, of accepting Israel, that this was no real estate deal where the two sides are just arguing where the territorial line should be. And you say that his sense of an unremitting hostility, Kissinger thought best not to overshoot, but a, a, allow an equilibrium to emerge that's predicated on what you call, I think, the stability of exhaustion. The more the Arabs realize they can't get what they want, but have to settle for incremental change and Israeli withdrawal in return for incremental peace, the more they become accustomed to at least the reality of Israel, which has implications over time. And you said that Kissinger always grappled with something you'd hear in Israel, too. There's an asymmetry between the tangible nature of withdrawal and the intangible nature and aspiration for a a distant peace, which you hope will come. But the the withdrawal can make you more vulnerable and not more secure. So it's it's hard to do this in the land for peace equation. But that Kissinger, taking all this together, felt gradualism was the only way. Yeah. So first of all, he didn't buy the territory for peace equation as in embodied in UN Security Council Resolution 242 because he himself didn't believe in peace as an achievable objective, not just in the Middle East, but just generally. He was quite jaundiced about this to the point where he saw the pursuit of peace with too much enthusiasm, which he felt Western and particularly American leaders were want to do would lead to its opposite. He called it the paradox of peace. And that's in his first book, which was about Europe, not about the Middle East, in in which he basically lays out, explains why he was sceptical of, of the pursuit of peace. Appeasement leading to the Second World War was the kind of prime example that he lived through. And so, therefore, what he cared about was not peace, but order. And it was 
order that would produce the stability that if it could be maintained would eventually lead to peace over a long period of time. And what he was trying to do was create the order, not the peace. But, and this is the kind of genius of Kissinger, and and it's little understood by those who have come after him in the United States, foreign policy establishment. He believed that there had to be a mechanism for legitimizing the order. And the only way to legitimize the order in the Middle East was to have a peace process. Not peace, but a process that would lead eventually to peace. But would in the meantime give the Arabs reason to stick with the order rather than go back to war, which they just launched. So there had to be a modicum of justice in the system in order for it to be stable. The order that he tried to create before the war didn't didn't hold. And so that's why there had to be a peace process. And critically important to this day, in my view, there had to be a territorial component to the peace process in order to legitimise it. In other words, the basic objective uh, of the Arabs was to regain the territory that Israel had occupied as a result of the 67 war, Sinai, the Golan Heights, the West Bank, and the only way that they could be persuaded to stick with the status quo was if Israel took some with territorial steps of withdrawal. Not the whole thing back to the 67 lines, because he didn't believe that Israel could absorb that politically and survive, and because he didn't believe that the Arabs were ready to reconcile with Israel, such as that territory for peace deal would actually work. So in those circumstances, he argued for, as you said, a gradual approach, an incremental approach. You don't try to jump to the end point, to an end of conflict, end of claims negotiation, because it's a bridge too far. It's too far for the Arabs, who aren't ready to accept Israel. It's too far for Israel because it's not prepared, who is not able to pay the territorial price in order to get that kind of peace. And so therefore he would argue to his Arab and Israeli interlocutors, let's go for something less. Let's go for a smaller step. As I like to say, it's about direction, not necessarily immediate destination. Exactly. And that's why I say that those who came after Kissinger, including us, you and me, David, didn't understand Kissinger, didn't know Kissinger. We never had a debate about whether we should go for an incremental step versus a comprehensive step. We were going for the end of conflict deal. And just about, well, I mean, Donald Trump and Jared Kushner, same thing. But it was true of all the presidents and all the secretaries of state that came after, more or less. But that is something that we need to understand, not because it's necessarily applicable in all cases, but I do think it's particularly applicable today in the Israeli-Palestinian context, where we can't get to the end of the conflict from where we are, and we need an incremental process. Right. And I want to get back to that in a moment. I think your point about you know, the priorities on order, and you want to legitimize that order by having a territorial component, but at a time where the U.S. is moving assets to deal with China, Israel and the Gulf are moving closer, and the idea that some of America's partners, and to extent Egypt and Jordan, can shoulder more of a regional role. Is it thanks to Kissinger's focus on regional order that together they can curb the adventurism of destabilizing actors like Iran, but peace might be good for the parties, but order is good for the whole region, There has to be the aspiration of peace for the order, and it has to be genuine. It can't just be process for process sake, but an order that that knits together America's friends in the region is a prerequisite if the U.S. is going to do less in the Middle East. 
it needs peace processes between Israel and its Gulf neighbors and Egypt and Jordan, because if America's partners are not in sync, that is going to mean America is going to have to always play a larger role, and it might have other regional challenges outside the Middle East. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. From Kissinger's point of view, order always preceded peace, as I've said. And in an environment in which you have a revolutionary power in the region, in the form of Iran, that is seeking to upend the status quo, and that is doing its best to undermine any efforts to achieve peace through its proxies in the region. An order in which Israel and the Arab states come together to counter Iran, contain Iran, reduce its ability to disrupt the status quo, is the prerequisite for any advance when it comes to Israeli-Palestinian peace. But within the context, the way in which the Israeli-Palestinian relationship has now stagnated into a kind of almost frozen conflict, almost because it's not entirely true there's all these terrorist attacks and Israeli military actions, and so there's always a degree of friction. But the lack of a Kissingerian incremental peace process to legitimize the order is a problem. And, of course, Israelis, starting with Prime Minister Netanyahu, like to argue that we don't need to worry about the Palestinians anymore. We can have peace with the Arabs and and everything will be fine. But if it blows up in the West Bank, which it could easily do, the Abraham Accords will come under pressure. I'm not going to predict that they're going to break, but they will come under pressure. And if it gets into a kind of Intifada 3.0, it'll be very difficult for those, the Arab states that have now normalized relations with Israel. So I think that it would be a mistake to ignore Kissinger's idea of a step-by-step incremental process that rebuilds trust, that gives the Palestinians a sense that their state is still achievable and that has a territorial component in terms of parts of the West Bank, 60% of the West Bank that's under Israel's control, parts of that West Bank, going to the Palestinian Authority in a way that would give the Palestinians a sense that there is still hope for an independent and contiguous Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. You know, as soon as I came out of the working with you and after the Kerry period where we tried, and this was the third effort by the United States to reach an end of conflict approach, Clinton in 2000, that you were a part of as well at Camp David, my colleague Dennis Ross, of course. There was the effort of Condoleezza Rice in 2007 and eight with Annapolis and all the Abbas Olmert meetings. And then the effort that you spearheaded for the United States, and I was part of your team on 2013-14. I see all three of these as noble efforts, but my conclusion was when we didn't synchronize this, when I came out was, you know, when you swing for the fences, you often strike out. And now there's various reasons for that. But I think for you, no less for me, two people have devoted a lot of our professional lives to this peace issue. This is not a small matter. And when you write on page 570, having repeatedly tried the alternative of an end of conflict Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement and failed It's time for U.S. policymakers to return to Kissinger's step-by-step approach as part of a broader strategy for building a new American-supported Middle East order. That's a big deal on a personal level. The, The implications of this journey for you as someone who's given it its all you're not saying give up. You're, you know, as I say, you're not looking at the Abraham Accords as a bypass. You see it like I do as a bridge. And so I'm just trying to, you know, to get a sense of, of if we had people say, okay, define that gradualism. What would that gradualism look like for you? What would it look like? First of all, just to point out that it wasn't just Clinton and Bush and Obama that sought end of conflict agreements. It was Trump as well. <laughs> 
they too, Kushner and Greenblatt and, and Friedman, were fond of, of saying we we're going to do something different because what everybody else had done had failed. But they didn't do something different. They actually did the same thing, and they too failed. So that's why I do think that we need to go back to the step-by-step process. And, and in saying that, it's interesting to note that Rabin, when he negotiated the Oslo Accords with Perez and Arafat and Abu Mazen, introduced a step-by-step process. The Oslo Accords was an incremental process. It provided for three steps, three phases of Israeli withdrawal without defining what the end game would be. It's nothing, as you know, about a Palestinian state, about Jerusalem, about refugees in the Oslo Accords. And so that's what I think we need to get back to. And what does that mean? Again, if you apply the Kissingerian principle of an incremental process with a territorial component, there is enough land in the West Bank for Israel to withdraw from some of it, to hand it over to the Palestinian Authority, to give credence and build trust in in the process. And you'll remember that on the last night of the negotiations that we were involved in, before they broke down, it was Netanyahu who sent his negotiators, Molcho and, and Tipi Livni, to make an offer to the Palestinians. What was the offer? 30,000 dunams in Area C, a territorial component. And the Palestinians were very interested before the whole thing blew up for other reasons that we don't need to go into. But my point is that if Netanyahu could do it, and by the way, his negotiator said, we don't need a cabinet decision. This is under the control of the defence minister. If Netanyahu could do it, then any new government in Israel after the elections could do it. And that is, I think, what the administration, which has basically been hands-off when it comes to any attempt at a peace process, should be doing. It should be trying to introduce an incremental approach rather than saying, well, we can't end the conflict, so we're not going to try Whenever it's all or nothing in the Middle East, it's nothing. I just really want to urge all the people listening to this podcast to really read Martin Indyk's book, Master of the Game, because it's, again, a first-rate piece of diplomatic history. Everyone who reads it will benefit from an enhanced sense of understanding of Kissinger's view of the Middle East, how the Middle East was changed by developments in the 1970s, the emergence of Sadat, you had also Rabin on the Israeli side. So you're, you're dealing with really outstanding actors at the time, and you bring it all to life with great analysis and really great sensitivity and enormous amount of data to back it up. And I just want to thank you very, very much, Martin and Dick, for joining us on this podcast. Thank you, David. It's a, it's a real pleasure. It was a pleasure to work with you on Peace. It's a pleasure to have you as a as a colleague in the think tank world, and it's a, it's a pleasure to have the chance to talk to you about it. So thank you, and thank you for your kind words. Martin Indyk has done a very deep dive into this incredible period of American Middle Eastern diplomacy. He has unearthed a lot of new material. Whatever his criticisms of Kissinger, He has had the good fortune also of Kissinger's long life now at the age of 99. This has enabled Martin not just to have access to Kissinger's papers, but to have wide-ranging conversations with the man himself. Martin is not the only one with good fortune. It is clear that Kissinger's good fortune is that he discovered that Egyptian President Anwar Sadat was dissatisfied with Moscow, and wanted to join America's side. Sadat realized that Russia could give him arms, but not his land. If he wanted to recover Egyptian land, the road he needed to travel was to Washington in order to reach Jerusalem. In the process of writing this book, Martin was reminded 
of the virtues of gradualism. It was Kissinger's disengagement agreements that set the foundation for Sadat to hit the home run and to make his historic flight to Jerusalem in 1977. This peace treaty has held ever since. Without Egypt and the war coalition, the interstate wars between Arabs and Israel beginning in 1948 ends with 1973. Yes, there are non-state actors like Hezbollah and Hamas, and there's always the Persian Iran, but many lives in these countries have been saved due to peace. Martin and us have tried full peace between Israel and the Palestinians, and we are reminded with this Kissinger book of the virtues of gradualism that can evolve into something that endures like the Egypt-Israel peace treaty. If it's only all or nothing in the Mideast, it is tragically often nothing. We could do well to remember the 1973 war and its aftermath. Its lessons are worth remembering to this very day. I want to thank all of our listeners from all over the world. I hope you listened to all of season four and to all previous seasons. You can find Decision Points on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcast, as well as on the Washington Institute website. Download and subscribe to never miss an episode. While you're there, please leave us a review and rating and tell your friends. I want to thank all those who made this podcast possible. Our coordinators, Gabriel Epstein, David Patkin and Jonah Schrock, and our researchers, Valeria De La Fuente and Stuart Harris. I also want to thank Jeff Rubin, Scott Rogers, Carolina Krauskopf, and Maria Rodacci of the Washington Institute. And finally, Adrian Bain, our producer, and Richard Myron from Earshot Strategies. Thank you all. <laughs>